So today we're going to talk about Gideon, and um, Gideon's kind of a, there's lots of spiritual activity in this story. And, and Gideon's a guy that has to deal with fear, and I don't know what your fears are. Um, you know, when I was in middle school, there were bullies that I had to deal with, okay? Those ladies were mean, okay? <laughs> yeah. And then we had um, roller coasters. I don't know. I'm afraid of getting way up there, and you know, my tummy gets all queasy, and ooh, you know, um, you know. Sometimes there are serious fears that we have. Okay, I, I always feel sad about Job's statement. What I feared the most has come upon me, and you're like, oh, that's a bummer. Um, I don't know. We all have to face fear. And you either face your fears and deal with them, or the fears will alter your personality. Okay? And so I think we don't want to be shaped by our fears. We want our faith to shape us. And so um, I, I think for you and me, even right now, this is a moment for us to go ahead and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take control of my spiritual life, which will impact my emotional life, which will impact my relational life, which will make me happy. Okay? So, yeah, a lot, a lot of things can happen. And, and really, courage is not the lack of fear. It's doing what you know must be done in spite of your fears. So, okay? Like, maybe you just have to have that painful conversation. Maybe you need to deal with that circumstance. Uh, it's, it's up to you. You've got to make it happen. And in Gideon's world, you know, the Israelites have been worshiping the Amorite gods. Okay? And so God saying, if you don't want me to be your God, you want to worship the Amorite gods, then... I'll let you deal with the consequences, and the consequences were the Midianites would come and they would sweep into the territory, um, destroy the crops, take all of the animals away, and basically Israel is starving to death. This is going on for seven years. So they got a real serious problem. Um, so finally... They come to the end of themselves and cry out to God, and God hears. And he comes and talks to a guy named Gideon, and Gideon becomes a judge. And a judge is not the guy that wears the black robe and sits on the court bench. The judge is kind of somebody that would have a heroic quality that would lead to saving the nation. Okay, so that's, that's what we're talking about here. And, and God would pick these leaders who were flawed. I feel like all of them were flawed except for the one woman judge. She was the one who wasn't flawed. Somehow there's poetic justice and truth in that. Um, you know, Gideon, he doesn't see himself as an epic hero, but God launches him into that role. And I like the fact that God chooses people with flaws. You know, there's this statement that, that God <clears throat> accepts you the way you are, but loves you too much to leave you that way. Okay? I think that's a good statement. And, and I don't know about you, but you know, I found myself 60-something, still working on my issues, still trying to surrender this and that and you know acquire what what I'm what I'm missing and I, I'm still on the growth path and I've talked to senior mature Christians who say yeah that that happens all the way until you have your last breath so I don't want you to just settle in and go well I just happen to be that way no if there's something that's out of alignment with God I think you and I are supposed to say hey God I'm running out of time to conquer this <laughs> And I'd like to let you have access to my personality, to my life, and make these changes. So God seeks out Gideon. Gideon is at the threshing wine press 
area. He's doing his chores. And, and the Lord introduces himself and shows up in angelic form and says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And this takes Gideon by surprise. First of all, a mighty warrior would not be threshing wheat. Okay. And by the way, this would be happening undercover because if it was out in front in public, that would be a, uh, the Midianites would, you know, put a stop to that. So it's kind of powerful because God speaks to Gideon. Boom. Miraculous moment. And God tells him, am I not sending you? And, and, and he, so he gives him, a, he introduces himself. He calls him a wide, mighty warrior, tells him, this is what I want you to do. And then says, I'm going to be with you. And so Gideon goes, wait, 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 let's back up. Um, I'm the smallest in my family, and my clan is the least in our tribe. I'm not a mighty warrior. He immediately disqualifies himself. And I think we have a habit of doing that, okay? We're quick to say, oh, not me. Hey, I'd love for you to share. No, I can share my faith. Well, I'd love to see you step into a leadership role. Oh, I'm not a leader. We just have this way of sidestepping an assignment that the Lord might want to ask you to do. Okay? God sees something about you. God knows who you can be. And it's not about who you can be. It's about who you are when God's your partner. Stop trying to go through life by yourself. Partner up with your senior partner. Okay? The lead pilot. And, and you be the co-pilot. God is my co-pilot. Switch seats. Okay? Let him be the pilot, and you're going to travel further with more fruit. And, and, and so I, I want you to understand something. This is what God says to Gideon. Am I not with you? And friends, you know this. You've got God with you. Now, whether you actualize this or not is up for grabs. Whether you identify yourself that God is with you, I mean, you know that theoretically. But if we put it into motion now, this should change the way you see your problems in life. You, I've got God with me. And, and I want you to hear me. Your identity is established by God, and you have an invitation to step into it. I'm a daughter of the Lord Most High. I'm the son of the living God. I have a, a covering. I have a calling. I have a friendship. I have everything necessary to deal with whatever I face. And, and Gideon argues with the Lord. And first he says, first, you got the wrong guy. And then he says, by the way... Um, why is all this happening to us, this starvation by the Midianites? If the Lord is with us, where are all the miracles that we, we heard about from our forefathers? Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now he's abandoned us? And, and really what's happening here is something kind of powerful. It is disappointment with God, frustration with God. I don't understand why God's doing things the way he's doing them. I don't like it. Okay? And, and I think all of us have to overcome some forms of disappointment. Why did God allow this? Why was I unable to, you know, fulfill this vow or accomplish that goal or achieve this end? Or well, We all have areas of our lives where it just didn't work out. We had a plan, and we had to go to plan B, and a lot of people stop, and they go, you know, I'm not moving to plan B. I'd rather fire God than move to plan B. And God's just on the other side of plan B going, well, I'm waiting for you. Step over here, because actually your plan is short-sighted. I know what's best for you, and I know what growth you have to go through, and I know what you don't know, and that... I have good plans in mind for your life. Okay? So, I don't know, you might have said, God, 
you know, where are you when I'm suffering? Why didn't you intervene when I was struggling? You know, why have I been treated so unfairly? Well, all of us, we have these questions. Some are more intense than others. I find that people who have gone through more difficult battles have a deeper faith than those who have gone through the shallow journeys of life. Just something I've made observation of. All right? And if you're one of those people, I just want to commend you. Because it's hard to grab a hold of God when you're hurting, when you're struggling, when it didn't work out. But I think it just activates God in the most powerful way when we move in that manner. And, and the real issue isn't that God abandoned the Israelites. The issue is the Israelites abandoned God. Okay. We have a God that has done all these radical things. Realize we're in Judges right now. Okay? So, Joshua, Moses, Joshua, Judges. There's a couple of lines in Judges that's repeated. Um, that Israel did what was right in their own eyes. They ended up jettisoning God's rules to let themselves rule how they dictate how they're going to go forward, and guess what happens? It's all bad. And I think we do that. When we jettison God, and we're going to be our own bosses and make our own rules and follow our own dictates, suddenly life doesn't seem to work so well anymore. Suddenly we have all kinds of problems. Well, I'm talking, you know, nationally, but it happens personally. And, and so, I guess for you and me, we expect God to bless us, protect us, provide for us, even though we're not engaging in Him. I run into non-church-going Christians, non-Bible-reading Christians, Christians not pursuing God in any way, shape, or form, but they're angry with Him when He doesn't show up and do what He's supposed to do. I'm like, well, you don't even have a relationship with Him. You're not even... I wouldn't say following the rules. You're just, you know, he exists for you and you have no idea that he's not a cosmic convenience store. He's the living God and you've got things backwards. You enter into the relationship, he shows up. And there's too many people out there who have a, a name Christian but don't have a lifestyle of relationship and pursuing the Lord. Okay? Well, God tells Gideon, go in you the strength that you have and save Israel. <laughs> okay, now what strength does he have? I'm the least from the smallest clan and my theology's a mess and I don't even know who you are or where you've been and... Um, Look at the assignment. Go defeat the enemy. Now the enemy, I forgot to mention. Um, <clears throat> the enemy is a conglomeration of armies that have come together and they're about to just infiltrate the land. It's bad enough that the Midianites have starved you to death. Now people are basically going to take your land away. Displace you genocide you. I want you to notice something. When does God step in? When, if he doesn't step in, it's the end of his people. So, I want you to go do this for me. And, and, and so Gideon's like, okay, um, so you're God, you're talking to me, um, if you're God and you're talking to me, that means that I, I need to bring an offering to you. Would you stay here and let me go and get the proper food offering and bring it back? And God says, okay, go do that. Now, does God really care about the proper food offering? No. So what's going on here? There's an expectation that when I have an encounter with God, that I'm going to bring an offering. Remember what I said on Sunday, David's words? I will not offer something to God that costs me nothing. Okay? 
Um, there's an expectation that when you encounter God, you're supposed to bring something. What does he want? A living sacrifice, your life. And, and he, what does he want? He wants, yeah, he wants to be honored. And, and Gideon knows this. So he brings a sacrifice. God waits. Um, the angel of the Lord touches the meal with his staff. It burns up and it's consumed. Miracle two. All right, following me here? But I think the meal sacrifice, it, it signifies something else. Fellowship. Okay, this is pretty amazing. And then he thinks, oh, I've seen God, I'm going to die. He's going, you're not going to die. You know, and, and now, um, Gideon, work with me here. He wants more assurance. So if I put the fleece down and it's wet on the ground but not on the fleece, then I'll know it's you. Then he shows up the next morning, wet on the ground, not on the fleece. Okay, now, now, don't, don't be patient. I'm going to put the fleece down, and this time I want it wet on the fleece and not on the ground. Boom. I don't know how it works or why it works, but sometimes when you want to test God, he's willing to pass your test. Other times... He has no regard for your test. I think sometimes when you want to say, you got to pass my test, he's like, really? I don't think I want to play that game. But I think when your heart is right and you're like, God, you know, am I really hearing from you? Can... I think the humble heart brings about a different response from God. Make sense? So God passes his fleece test. Well, um, I think God works with our doubts. He works with our struggles. He's patient with us. The doubts that he can't deal with are when we cross our arms and go, oh, I just don't know what to think, and then we don't pursue. We don't research. We don't ask. We don't investigate. We just decide to doubt. And I think you're going to get to the end of your life, and, and you're going to realize, I could have had a V8. I could have had this relationship with God. I could have thrown up prayers and moved the hand of God. I could have expected miracles. I could have seen him answer prayers. I could have been in a conversation with God my whole life, and I, I just based it on this one little scientific doubt. I don't know. I'm against that. Well, God gives Gideon his assignment. First, he says, this is what I want you to do, take down the, the army. But, but since we're in this relationship here, I have another assignment. I want you to tear down your father's idols and put up an altar to me. Okay? And so, in the middle of the night, Gideon gets his boys. They tear down the town altar and put up an altar to the Lord. And so in the morning, everybody gets up. What happened to our altar? Where's Gideon? And his father says, what? Maybe you're defending the wrong God here. And obviously, Gideon's father was an impressive man and able to change the atmosphere. Because maybe he said, uh, how, how has worshiping the Amorite gods helped us in any way? But let me get personal. How has you walking with God impacted your life in any way? It's supposed to. Okay? It's supposed to release an empowerment inside of you. Begin a relationship with Him. Release the power of prayer. Uh, the healing touch. There's supposed to be something that you are different than you were before God entered your life. If not, then I'm going to just say you have an amazing situation awaiting you. All you have to do is say, God, pastor says that this is not just a theological philosophy that I adhere to. 
pastor says that you're real. And so I'm now asking for you to come become real in my life. All right? That's your assignment. Or you might say, well, you used to be real in my life, but I don't see you doing anything else right now. Well, is he calling you to do something, calling you to pray about somebody, asking you to participate in ministry, nudging you to, to give money, to, to talk to somebody, to exercise your faith in any way? Step into it. All right? Well, um, sometimes the other God in our life, it's, it's not an idol, it's, you know, many people have made God their, money their God. I was with someone the, a few weeks ago, and they said, you need to have the right relationship with your money. And they told me that the same week that I was with somebody who has the wrong relationship with their money. So I could actually see it in, in, you know, this person lives for the money and their life and they have a lot of it and they're completely unhappy and unsatisfied and on the verge of suicide. And, and you're like, whoa, what is that? The other person, man, if he told you all the trials he's been through, but he has the right relationship with money and he's blessed and he's happy, and I think he's kind of wealthy too, all right? Even though this business deal went sour, and that one he got screwed over with, and this other situation he's not sure about, the right relationship with almighty money leads to the right relationship with God, or vice versa. You know, we can make our experience, I've had experience with this. God is ready to change your experiences, and do something fresh. You know, my education, trust me, education is overrated. Our achievements, whatever, okay? The only thing that matters is the achievement of getting closer to the Lord, okay? Even our theological stances, you know, I want to have the right theology. And I notice that you have the wrong theology when it comes to taking the communion, and therefore, I don't know that I can go to church with you because I think that it's a symbol of the presence of God and you think it's actually His presence and so we're not going to fellowship anymore. Huh? Really? Come on. That's exactly what Satan would like to do. Separate Christians from coming together. Now, I'm after the right theology. Don't think I'm not. But I've gotten a further along in my journey to not major on the minors. Because I've noticed that the minors can really... Um, it's going to destroy relationships. All right? An idol is an object of excessive devotion. So what do you spend all your energy on? That's a great place to start. So he cuts down the town's idols... And um, now God is ready to move. He's got himself in a relationship with God. He's got God prominently established in his town, in his life. Okay? And God's ready to show up. So, there's this one cool passage in Judges 6.34. He was filled with the Spirit of God. <laughs> Do you know that I just pray to be filled with the Spirit of God all the time? I'm after it. I want it. That's my secret weapon. That the Spirit of Jesus takes me over, fills me up, pours through me. That's what I want. This is what I'm after. Okay? And this is where Gideon is. And, oh, by the way, the Midianites and all this army that they have, they're on huge camels that are really fast. And so if you're a soldier and the huge camel's coming after you really fast and there's, they're as vast as the sand on the seashore, this army. 
So I just want you to see what these Israelites are up against, right? This is ancient tanks. Well, Gideon makes a call out, guys, we got a problem. We got these folks coming against us. 32,000 people show up. And then God steps in and says, okay, um, that's too many. So anybody who's afraid, send them home. So 21, 22,000 of them go home. It's got 10,000. God says, oh, yeah, that's way too many. Um, we're going to have to, uh, how about this? Go to the river, and everybody who takes water with their hand to drink, and the others who just lap it up, the ones who take water from their hand, send them home. So now 97% of the army is gone. All right? It's 300 people left. 300. And God says, all right. Why did he do that? He wants to make sure that they know that what the victory that's about to happen is going to be him protecting, him providing, him moving, not on Israel's strength. Okay? He's their protector, provider, and God. So, you know, here we have a situation where I, I want you to feel something. Um, when we do what God says, and remember, his ways are not our ways, okay? Um, when, he, when Moses does what he's supposed to do, um, Pharaoh, the mightiest nation on earth, comes to an end. Okay? When Joshua does what he's supposed to do, the Jordan River stops flowing. When they march around Jericho, okay, the walls fall down. When they're thrown into the fire, they're not burned up. When you're thrown into the lion's den, the lions don't attack you. When you do what God asks you to do, okay, guess what happens? You're in the right spot. And I want you to think about what battles you're facing right now. Maybe you have a health battle. Maybe you have a relationship battle. Maybe you have a faith battle. Maybe people you love no longer believe in the God that you raised them to know. Maybe you got a personal issue with God. I don't know why you allowed this to happen in my life and I'm unhappy. Maybe, I don't know what it might be. But I want you to hear me. This is the right place to be. In conversation with Him, following Him anyways, because when you follow Him anyways, you're going to see God show up. He's going to fight your battles. Okay? I like what Sean said on Sunday. You know, I have one thing to do, and that's follow him. It's all, it's all we're called to do. Follow him. Well, friends, all this interaction, and Gideon is still scared. So God says, all right, I want you to sneak up to the camp and tell me what you hear. So he sneaks up to the camp, and he hears a conversation going on in a tent. The guy says, you know, I had a dream, and it's all going to go bad for us. And the guy says, oh, that's because Gideon, the man of God, is, is going to be victorious, and God's going to give him the Midianites and all of the camp. Okay? So he wanders up to some random tent to listen to some random conversation, and what's the content? God is going to give you a victory. Now, you'd like to think that Gideon would have already figured out that this is going to be, but he's like us, still a little nervous. So God, do you mind giving me a little more assurance? And what does God do? Gives him the assurance. I want you to see how patient God is, how often he will work with us, how he'll stay by our side, put up with our weakness. And he wants to accomplish his goals through us. So um, God gives them just a couple of weapons. 
I want you to have torches that you're going to cover with jars, and I want you to have a horn, and at midnight, I want you, 300 of you, I want you to surround this vast army, and at the right time, we're going to break the jars, raise their torches, blow the horns, and when the, they do that, all the armies hear the sound and they see the torches all over the place and they get nervous and scared and jump up and kill one another as they run for their lives. Yet another miracle. Okay? You see, you belong to God and God's going to fight your battles. Sometimes he does it in a way you just don't think. You know, sometimes we might say, Lord, save my child from this horrible situation, but maybe it's in the horrible situation that he's going to meet Jesus. What's better? Meeting Jesus, right? So, sometimes you just have to let God be God in their life, in our life, and just trust this amazing God, okay? He will be with you. I want to say this again. Um, <clears throat> what Gideon had to learn was that God will be the one who is fighting the battle. It was God's decision to break in and save his people. It's God's decision to be patient and show himself, reveal himself to Gideon. It's God who's orchestrating the atmosphere and people's responses. It's God reestablishing himself in your life. And, and, and I, I think it's, it's courage is not fearlessness. It's doing what you know you've got to do even when you're afraid. You know, I had a meeting yesterday and there was no chance that it was going to go well. Zero chance. Good conversations go bad. You know what I mean? So this was going to be a bad conversation. So I woke up at four in the morning. I was all nervous. Came into the sanctuary and prayed about it. Brought in partner. Sat down to have the meeting. Didn't feel confident in the meeting. But God had his way. His way, not my way. God brought about the right outcome in my perspective, <clears throat> as the leader, okay? My point is, I wasn't confident. I was nervous. But what did I do? I prayed. What did I do? I pursued fellowship. What did I do? I sat down to listen. What did I do? Brought grace to the table. And God shows up. So this is a stupid little example of this big situation here, okay? And, and, and I've learned this. When you bring God into the little assignments, you gain a track record with His faithfulness that prepares you for the big assignments. Okay? This is what I've learned. That's all I got today.